Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 336 of How Do You Write? I'm Rachel Heron. So pleased that you are here with me today as I am talking to Tian Kim Lam. And we have a fantastic conversation, which is going to, I guarantee you, inspire you. We talk about how you are a writer, how you, the person listening to my voice right now, you are a writer. And we talk about how thinking is writing. And we also talk about surviving criticism, how to do that and what is necessary to survive that criticism. So please stick around for that. What is going on around here? Oh my gosh, what isn't going on around here? Um, We got the house. Apparently we got the house, which is just, can I say the house of our dreams? It is so beautiful. It is in this beautiful village in Wellington, five minute drive away from the central business downtown and 15 minute bus ride. The bus stops at the end of the street, multiple, many buses an hour. It's incredible. Uh, It's the cutest house. It's on a flat part of Wellington, which is practically unheard of. It's not in a flood danger zone. It's got three or four, at least three cafes short walk away. The library down the street has a cafe inside it. There are restaurants. There are things to do, but it's kind of a sweet, sleepy village um, that is part of Wellington proper. And um, it's it's amazing. We're just kind of stunned. We have gone what is called unconditional, which means I think it would be very difficult for us to get out of it and very difficult for the seller of the house to get out of it. So it is basically like a done deal. It's a done deal. We get it on, we move, we get the keys on January 20th, which is less than a month away as I record this. So um, of course we were not planning on buying a house. We were only kind of testing the waters of buying a house. We did not think we would get approved and we did. And then we found a place and we bought it. And then we went on vacation. <laughs> and so nothing is packed. Nothing is done. I'm literally in the middle of trying to find movers. And we're so excited. And also we just got back from our holiday, which was tramping the Abel Tasman track. And it was divine. It was so cool. We went unconditional on the house the day before we left, hours before we left, basically. So we got a lot of time to walk around and think about our new home in Wellington. And um, the track itself is incredibly beautiful. It is all golden sand and turquoise beaches. It is South Pacific Island feeling. It is at the top of the South Island. And we didn't know what the weather was going to be like. It looked like it was going to be kind of rainy the whole time. We never got rained on once. We got heavily misted on several times. And there was one day where it was pretty gray all day, but it was still beautiful. And we just walked and walked and walked and walked. We walked all day, every day. Oh, except for the middle day where we didn't do anything. We stayed at this resort and um, sat on the beach and went for swims and uh, played in the sand and put on so much sunscreen and so much insect repellent that in a couple of days, I cannot even imagine how, how broken out I'm going to be from all of that that we slathered on all day. The sand flies are pretty extreme, big, big biters. And the mosquitoes at this resort we were staying at, I am not exaggerating when I say I killed 50 in our room. I brought this um, journal that I was going to write in, <laughs> I, a little journal that I bought at the Guggenheim Museum in Venice. Uh, and I used it to kill mosquitoes. It's just covered with mosquitoes. And it's a it's a disgusting souvenir. And of course, I didn't keep the the back of it, but I did rip off the back that I was using to kill all of them. And another seven thousand or so bit us, but uh, that's okay. That is absolutely okay. The food was amazing. We did it the supported way, so our bags were carried uh, to. Or we didn't. We we just had an extra bag with like extra clothes in it um, that was carried to the next night's location by the company. And every morning they would give us lunch and then we would get out and walk and we would walk and walk and walk. And it was marvelous. I think my favorite part of it, I have so many favorites, but my favorite part of it was just, this is going to sound dumb, but just the mechanical process of walking, the swinging my legs and the swinging the poles. We, you know, used walking poles, definitely necessary, uh, 
oftentimes it was muddy and slippery and up rocks and down rocks and uphills and downhills, but I loved the feeling of just continuing to walk and then getting tired and then walking some more and then kind of feeling what our bodies could do, even though we were never sweated that much in my life. And we just kept going and it felt amazing. And um, my uh, another favorite part was we got down to this place called Mutton Cove. We had been walking, we had been hiking toward it, toward one of these golden sandy beaches. Oh, there's some birds fighting outside. And then we got to the beach and um, we sat down, we're eating a little snack. It wasn't quite lunchtime yet, but we look out into this crystalline blue turquoise water and there's just a pot of dolphins leaping there's almost no one a, a couple of other hikers passed on the beach and they saw it we kind of pointed it out to them but otherwise we're alone we're alone for most of the time on these tracks because it is remote and far away and people don't do this much and that day in particular we were on the part of the hike that nobody goes on a lot fewer people go on um there's a uh, a very hiked part of the Abel Tasman. And then there's this extra part that goes up and around separation point. And we had, we had been doing that one that would, that day, 15 K hike. And we saw these dolphins just playing in front of us, splashing and leaping. And um, unfortunately we were on a time crunch because we needed to be picked up at the end of this day. And we'd already been abandoned by the the water taxi that needed to get us to where we were to depart from that day. So we couldn't have a nice swim. Otherwise, if we were not on that time crunch that day, if we didn't have to keep hiking, I would have just shucked off all my clothes, even though I didn't have a bathing suit and gone in the water and had a swim and with those dolphins because wow, but we just sat there and watched and ate our apples and put on more sand fly repellent and kept going. And it was amazing. It was truly, truly wonderful. So that was our holiday. And we got back late last night uh, after midnight coming in on the ferry and drove home right up the hill to where we live now. And now we're starting to think about where we're going to move and how to do it and how to get boxes and how to do all the things. And I'm super excited and also incredibly distracted from doing any kind of work. I am going to, and then this next week, I'm really torn, honestly. New Zealand as a whole pretty much goes on vacation from now which is, you know, the, the week before Christmas until about January 13th, January 19th, right around there. And I'm thinking about taking the week off between Christmas and New Year's because no one will be working then, but I could work. That's the thing. I could keep working on the evergreen course I'm working on putting out. And I don't know, I'm thinking about it. I love my job so much, but I also do like taking time off. So I will, I'll be thinking about that, tossing that around in my head. And, um, I think that is enough of an exciting update. And now I would love to get into this amazing, beautiful interview with Tian Kim. You're going to love it. Please stick around for that. And I wish you incredibly happy writing, all of you. And if I don't hear from you before uh, the end of the year, happy new year to you. Let's move into 2023. We'll be talking about planning and gearing up for the next year and your next year of writing talking about that soon. In the meantime, I hope you're having a marvelous time and I hope you're getting a little bit of writing done and please come tell me about it. All right. Talk to you soon. And here we go with Tian Kim. And I almost forgot to give her bio. Here she is. Tian Kim Lam writes stories about Vietnamese characters who smash stereotypes and find their happy endings. A recovering type Asian, she guzzles oh, I, uh, Cafe Suda. I think it's Cafe Suda makes art and bakes her feelings to stay sane. Tian Kim is also the founder of Body Bookrooms, a subscription box that pairs sexy romances with erotic toys. She's been featured on Jezebel, NPR, BBC America, and Glamour. Her debut novel, Happy Endings, is now available and her forthcoming book will be released soon. So here, please enjoy this amazing interview and Happy New Year, everybody. Well, I am so excited to finally have you on the show. Will you please share your name and your pronouns with us? Yes, of course. My name is Tim Kim Lamb. My first name is Tim Kim, and my pronouns are she, her. 
I am so happy to see you. I think we shared a couple of coaching calls together, but there was this one. Um, and when I say coaching, I'm talking about Becca Syme, of course, Clifton Strengths, Becca Syme. Um, but there was one coaching call in which we were just realizing how close our strengths were and like typing back and forth. And I was like, I need to know this person better. So yeah, that's what I like about those group coachings is that you don't know who's going to be in the yeah. room with you. Yeah. Uh, and then sometimes you just hit it off with somebody. Exactly. It's so it's so fun. Well, you are blowing it up with your first book. I am seeing, and you've got a new book coming out in uh, when is Happy Endings coming out? Oh no, Happy uh, Endings happy is endings out now. It's the first one. Full Exposure comes out in January. Oh. Oh, sorry, February. It was originally slated for December, but you know, like the whole supply chain thing, it got moved. And you are with Avon, which is how, where I started. Um, and Avon is such a great imprint. Who is your editor then? I know you told me. My editor is Erica Sang. She's so, so cool. I just feel so lucky to have snagged Erica. I mean, She's she edits so cool. all the great Avon writers. So yes. Beverly Jenkins, yes. Alyssa Cole, Alicia Rye. I mean, I couldn't have asked for a better editor. Oh my God. I just got like goosebumps. I was with Mei Chen over there and, um, and I loved Mei, uh, but, but I would always like sit at Erica's table and just go, you are the coolest at like conferences and stuff. Can you tell us about your writing process? How and where and when do you get it done? Uh, <laughs> this has been my struggle. Yay. So I'm long. glad um, we're going to talk about yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I run a business, I am married, I have teenagers, so it's been a challenge for me to prioritize my writing because for so long writing didn't pay the bills right sure. and I needed to pay the bills yeah so now I'm really working on this mind mindset shift you know on my third book even I'm starting my third book and it feels uh, challenging still so I've been trying different things and before I just kind of snuck it in until the deadline loomed I'm like oh my god I gotta finish this <laughs> So then it was a lot of like all nighters. I don't know. I, um, I, um, I know that if people watch Becca's TikTok, she talks about um, the Phoenix method and I resisted that, that title. So for those who don't know, Phoenix is just like a Phoenix. You are, um, you just work super hard to the very end and you burn up and you need recovery time. <laughs> and I did that for the edits for happy endings and then finishing the draft for um, full exposure and I kept going, I don't want to be a Phoenix. Being a Phoenix is too hard. It's just hard on my family. Um, hard on me, obviously. Yeah. And then I thought about it and I thought back to like my college papers and I wrote them all the night before. <laughs> so I don't think I can change it. It's just who I am and I have to figure out um, the best way to do it. So I've been giving, um, I've been setting aside time. I went through my calendar um, over the weekend and I marked out um all the days that I knew I could write um, and focus. So I'm the type of writer that needs at least like the first sprint, like 25, 30 minutes to really get into my book. So I think focus is one of my top um, strengths. Um, oh. And once I'm in the zone, I can keep going. Oh. Um, That's where oh, we yeah. differ. I think I have like no focus. Focus has got to be like 31 <laughs> for me or something like that. What are your top five strengths, if you don't mind? Um, strategic is number one. Input is to look at cool yes. my little notebook. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, deliberative, relator, learner, ideation, focus is number seven. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. My, my input uh, is up there with yours and, and at number one. And, uh, but yeah, the focus is, I think that's, that must feel like a superpower to get into it because I feel like I, I because I don't have focus, like I can write for 25 or 30 minutes and I am just as distractible at the end of those 25 minutes as I was before. Well, see, so I envy you that you can just write like at the drop of a hat because I have to go get back into my book yeah. um, and, and live in that world. And so, um, you know, I remember when I first started writing and people say, oh, write whenever you get a chance. Like you have kids, like just write when you're waiting for the bus. I can't, I have to get into the zone yeah. and get into the minds of my characters. So it does feel like a challenge sometimes when I think, oh, well, I have an hour here. And then my strategy is like, an hour is not enough time. 
<laughs> right? I'll just like do X, Y, Z instead. And then some days I end up not writing and then I get mad at myself. So I'm definitely working on being nicer to myself and trying to plan out writing days better. And it makes so much sense too, as the Phoenix writer that you are though, that the that the focus just is so much intensified, intensified. I'm picturing like the sun through a magnifying glass at that <laughs> at that point when you are doing those fine, you know, the, the final push to get there. Yeah, things are slow at the beginning. So I'm still at the beginning of this manuscript and um, I'm telling myself like, it's okay to go slow and just to really um, give myself time to get to know the world. Yeah. Thankfully, it's in the same world as the first two books. So that part's not too hard, but like really getting into the minds of the character and oh. know where I want to go. That sounds so cool. How, and how old are your teenagers? I have, their birthdays are November. So they'll be 17 oh my gosh, and 13. So, oh my goodness. Yeah. I just can't imagine doing literally anything with teenagers. So my hat is off to you. That is plus your business, which we're going to get into. And I can't wait to talk about what is your biggest challenge when it comes to writing? My biggest challenge is, um, I think before I was listening to too much advice, uh, perhaps advice, right? I read uh, Becca's intuitive writing book and the whole time I was like, yes, that's me. That's mm -hmm. me. That's me. Um, and so for this book, I'm like, I'm not reading any more craft books. <laughs> because they're just going to mess with my brain Yes. Uh, because I think, you know, I'm writing romance. So I'm, I'm the whole time, like, oh, I got to follow the beats, but now I'm trusting myself to know where the beats are going to be because I've been reading romance since I was like 10, right? Like we, it's ingrained in yeah. us. We know just by, just by, yep. you know, reading all of it. We feel so that's it. what I'm aiming for this go round. That uh, book by Becca Syme, if people haven't read it, intuitive writing, was it called just intuitive writing? No, uh, you, no dear, like, dear, dear writer, are writer. you intuitive? Yes, that's it. Okay, so so yeah. good. Really, really recommend. Um, what is your biggest joy when it comes to writing? Is that when I write a scene and it just feels good, like the words are flowing and I finish, I'm like, that was, it just flowed out of me, right? And it felt good. I didn't agonize over the words or what was happening. And I, I think those are the really emotional moments. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, there's this great scene in the second book, Full Exposure, where the hero decides to just um, let himself go and let and trust the heroine. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I wrote that sucker so fast. <laughs> um, and it, and even when I read it again, I'm like, you know, this is still good. Like I didn't mess it up. Isn't that wonderful when we do have those fast emotional rides and then later we think, oh no, I wrote it so fast, it's going to be horrible. And it's just awesome. Yeah. I wish that that happened more to me or that I could plan me? it. But that... I wish it happened every time I sat down. <laughs> a freaking men. Can you share a craft tip of any sort with us? A craft tip. Okay. I, I feel like we're um, Becca Syme super fans. But yes. Yes. I think, um, what shifted me the most is maybe it's not necessarily craft, but um, thinking is also working on your writing. Okay. That was huge to me. Tell yeah. me more about that. Um, you know, because, you know, I'm strategic and I have deliberative as one of my top mm -hmm. So I have to think about the book quite a bit. Like I actually see um, scenes in my head, like a movie. And then how do I translate this onto the page? Right. Um, so I need that time to process and think about it. And I remember when, um, I turned the first draft of full exposure in and my editor got back to me. And she's like, well, you've got the basics. I'm like, oh. <laughs> oh, um, and yeah. revisions were so hard and I kept getting stuck. And I realized like I was trying to force myself to figure out what happened next, but I wasn't giving my brain the time to process what I had already written, what I had changed. And once I allowed myself to do that, they weren't as tricky. Mm. That is so, so very similar to what happened with me in my second book where May called me and said, if the writing is so good, but, and, but she said to me, but you have no plot. <laughs> and I had to also get out of my way and learn how to trust myself to do the right thing, you know, and it's, it's so hard and so scary. Um, it was. And so then when I turned in those edits, I said, Erica, this is a totally different book. Just to warn you. <laughs> It, it really was, but so much better. I felt so much, um, I was proud of my words as opposed to before. I was like, I don't know if this is working, yeah. but the deadline's here and you take it. 
Because we know, I think we know on a gut level when we turn things yeah. in that aren't quite there and we just hope that they'll be fine. We hope that the editor will come back and say, good job, but we know, we know. So how are you then in this third book, how are you thinking about building in that deliberative thinking time? Oh gosh, I haven't, um, I'm going to trust my intuition to do it because I think Yay. if I, um, I'm kind of a rebel and I think that's my, my ah. individualization. Like if I try to plan too much, I'm like, no, I, even if they're my own plans, I'm like, I don't want to follow. I don't want to follow them. <laughs> I have a very good friend who is number one Indy, and uh, oh, my she, goodness. it's, she can't, if somebody says to her to do anything, including herself, she will immediately do the opposite, which is, I want her biggest strength. And also I'm like, that must be difficult on some days. Yeah. So awesome. Yeah, yes. I can't imagine being a number one. <laughs> Uh, okay. So would you like to share, would you mind sharing what is the most mortifying moment you've ever survived as a writer? Okay. Well, it's been a couple years, three years. So, so some I recovery time. It without getting too upset. <laughs> I um, paid for a, a critique from an editor and it was, a, a, it was back when we still did more face-to-face -face things mm -hmm. and it was a small group in the editor. Um, so uh, three three of three writers and then the editor and she'd gotten our first chapter and she just ripped it to shreds <sighs> and I was taught <sighs> to not argue back right right you just listen to the um to the critique and then if, you if you come from that literary tradition you right I mean I didn't go we, to school for yeah. that but I always thought that you know you're supposed to listen to critique and then yeah. you decide what you're going to do um, but she just didn't get my work. Mm -hmm. And I knew that sitting there listening, but I was just so angry mm -hmm. and so upset that the way she, I mean, I, I think that you can give construct, um, constructive criticism without tearing someone down. Absolutely. I think she's in a bad mood oh. and she just ripped me and one other author to shreds. And then the third author, she gave the author her card and was like, send me this manuscript. In front of the all rest of this of us. in front of you. Oh, yeah, my God, in front of me and the other author. And I was like, This is the most horrible experience ever. And I paid for it. I paid you paid for abuse. Yeah, yeah. Let me yeah. ask you then, what was your recovery from like from that? Like, did that book ever become anything? Did it that book is happy endings? Hell yes, it is. I Except was hoping you would say yeah. that. I was yeah. hoping you would say that. I was going to be so sad I, if you put it in the drawer and walked away. I did it. Look, I remember when I um, got the <sighs> call from Erica and after the initial excitement, I was like, take that, so-and-so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that actually, you know, made that was a year later. Um, <sighs> actually, was it a year later? No, because I pitched at the same conference, actually. <gasps> I pitched at the same conference. Um, and then so like, what? Six months later, I got the oh, call. Oh my uh, God. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but oh my gosh, what an awful experience that was. I would hope that never happens to any writer, especially someone who's never published. It's not right? okay. That's one of my like primary missions in life is to tell people it is not okay for your writing ever to be treated like that. Constructive criticism can always come from a place of kindness and honesty, but it has to be uplifting. Otherwise, these people need to shut up and get up. Like you're yeah. only harming people. Especially if you don't get where the writers came yes. from, you know, like um, obviously the editor was not a person of color and just did not get where I was going with my story. I'm so bad for you. And I'm so pleased that it ended up so well and suck it other editor. That's right. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. That is really, really meaningful. What is the kindest thing that anyone's ever done for you uh, in your writing career? There's so many, but uh. just, I think to dovetail what we talked about is that right after that I held it together I was so proud of myself I did not cry in front of this editor because good like, job she does good not job. get the satisfaction of watching yes. me cry um and I left the room I walked out of a certain conference I walked to the bar and um Angelina M Lopez was the first person she's like hey how's it going and that was what I was like <laughs> <laughs> Um, and she took such good care of me. Like she gave me a hug and she brought me over to some author friends. She's like, we've all been there and everyone was sharing their stories, similar stories. Um, and while it didn't make the pain of that experience go away, um, just knowing that I had such a supportive environment um, 
you know, like made me, it made me um, not, um, it made me believe in myself because yeah. all these people, like they knew it wasn't my writing, even though they'd never read it. Like they knew I didn't deserve to be treated like that. Yes. And, um, that community. Yeah. And, oh, thank you for saying that. But because it, for me, so much of this comes always back to community and the writer friends that we prop ourselves up with. Because what if you had been a brand new baby writer? This is your very first experience at a conference. You don't know anyone. You don't go to the bar. You go back to your hotel room and then you leave on the plane the next day. What would have happened to you if that got into I your head? And that was all you. Absolutely. You would have. Absolutely. You yeah. would have. And instead you run into people in the bar and they propped you up. So that is another push for listeners to find the community, find the community. Thank you. Yeah. What's the, what's the kindest thing find you've ever done online for Online too. Yes. Oh, the yes. kindest thing. So I make it my mission whenever I run into someone, especially now as a published author, people go, oh my gosh, you know, you're an author. Like I write too, you know, um, or like, uh, but I'm not a writer. I'm like, yes, you are. So I, especially for people of color, I say, if you write, you are a writer. And you that's, a writer. that's my thing now. And that happened to me actually this weekend, there was a, a college student and she was so excited about my book. Um, you know, I had, I had told her about it and she's like, this is so great. Um, she's like, I write fan fiction. I'm like, great. You're a writer. And she just looked at me like, what? I'm a writer. I'm like, you wrote fan fiction is writing. And I told her about some authors who made their start with fan fiction. Absolutely. And she's like, you know, last year I wrote a whole I wrote 140,000 words in one story. I'm like, you wrote a freaking book, <laughs> two books. <laughs> Most people don't do that. Most people, right. that is that you are a writer. Oh my God. And she has that now in her head forever because you ran into her and you were kind. And well, I hope that. it inspires her if she wants to, to write, you know, keep writing that she'll keep doing it. I believe in that so much. <laughs> I made a TikTok the other day. And I um, told people that if they write, they're a writer. And then I left them space to say it. And I've never done on the podcast. So let's do that right now. I'm going to, let's both of us um, ask the listener to, we're going to give it like four seconds. We're going to say, uh, listener, please, right now, I want you to say out loud, I am a writer. Go. Okay. That probably felt uncomfortable for a bunch of people. What would you say? Say it again. Say it again. Okay. Four more seconds. And now, Tin Kim, would you please... Speak to that writer who just said it out loud in their car. I'm a writer. And then they felt stupid. What would you say to them? If you write, you're a writer. It doesn't matter if you're paid for it. If other people read it. Yeah. If it brings you joy when you write. You're a writer. Uh, oh my gosh. I have little tears in my eyes. That's beautiful. Thank you. What is the best book that you've read recently, and why did you love it? Okay, so I prepared because I'm wrapping up. I have three books. I read. Yay! Good. Tell books. us. Tell us all of them. <laughs> okay, um, I recently listened. So I'm an audiobook listener as Yay. well, reading with my eyes. So the sweetest connection by Denise Williams. It's a uh, part of a three novellas where um, um, the romances happen inside an airport. Oh, cute. What a cute um, so idea. The connection is really great. I think it's um, one is like a gate agent and the other one works in a chocolate shop um, in um, the airport. Super cute. Adorable. Um, dual narration, uh, which was also really fun. So I felt like I was listening to a radio show. Uh, yeah. Oh, um, when uh, We Were Dreamers by Simi Liu. And I actually listened to that as well. Um, I don't know if you follow him on Twitter, but he's so funny. Um, no, but I know the and, name. He must in have Kim's seen. Convenience. He plays Shang. Right, Shang of course, Chi. of course, yes. Um, but I saw him in Kim's Convenience, where he plays an Asian himbo, um, which is so so fun because it's something that um, we don't normally see in Western um, and television media. I'm just gonna say he's worthy of being a himbo. I mean, I'm sure he's very smart. <laughs> well, actually, if you listen to his, if you listen, if you read his book, he's like, I was not a, I was not a good student. So maybe. Oh, so it's a memoir. It is a memoir. Oh, cool. Um, and it's very raw. Um, and he's so honest about his relationship with his parents because oh. they did not mesh well. And um, it made me uncomfortable because he talked about things that I could relate to. I'm like, oh, yeah. I don't like if I talk about this. Oh, that, that means it's that means it's deep. It is deep. It is deep. Um, so I highly recommend that. Thank you. you know, um, he's a great narrator. And I'm then, a memoir junkie too. So yeah, it's it's great. Um, and then the last book that I want to talk about is called Blood Thinners. It's a sapphic romance by Heather Novak. Um, so full disclosure, um, um, 
this book we I chose for a body performance box. Um, and Heather is now um, a virtual assistant on my team. So, but that was before. Awesome. Um, she became an assistant after um, we put the book in the box. So, <laughs> so yeah. So it's um, urban. Well, I guess it's paranormal, um, paranormal sapphic romance. But I find it like on the lighter, funny side as opposed to like the darker. I am romance. getting it immediately because I just finished writing a paranormal sapphic. So, um, thank you, thank you. I'll just be purchasing all of these. Um, Absolutely. Will you please tell us a little bit about happy endings now? Sure. So Happy Endings is my debut uh, romance book with Avon, uh, my dream publisher. Yes. And it's an interracial romance between a Vietnamese American woman who sells sex toys for a living. So similar to my experience. Uh -huh. And um, her um, ex, uh, a Black man who owns a soul food restaurant in D.C. And um, they had an awful breakup. He, he ghosted her for reasons you'll find out um, later in the book. Um, but because his restaurant is in the part of DC that's being gentrified, he's losing business. So they work together and have sex toy pop-up shops in his restaurant to kind of drum up more business and get new customers in there. And things get hot and heavy in the kitchen and outside the kitchen, on the bar, <laughs> in a chair, in a booth, you know, <laughs> it's very I, spicy. <laughs> I love a second chance romance. Also, speaking of spicy, can you please tell us about body bookworms and what it is this is about i think i saw on the site that it's like six you're in your sixth year of doing this now seventh year seventh year wow i know it's, it's hard to believe um so body bookworms is just a B, B, and i will just clarify b-a-w-d-y yes yes, yes. <laughs> um so it's two things i love so um i have a background in sex education and sex toys and um, romance books and as the business has um grown um and before we would just feature spicy romance books but now um that uh I've always been passionate about um you know more inclusive romances which when I started were not that many traditions yeah. published um so now all our boxes include um a diverse romance so for me diverse means um BIPOC queer um disability neurodiverse you know um under underrepresented communities mm -hmm. so it's a very broad definition just people who are not used to seeing um themselves ourselves in romance yeah. books right and then for me the other components like I got a lot of my sex ed from reading romance so um I want yeah. to find romance with great consent you know good you know, model good relationships and then provide like fun erotic adult toys to go with it so that you can have the full experience and there's always batteries included <laughs> I wish that I I don't know I lived in the states anymore but but I wish that it was shippable to New Zealand um, my wife used to work for good vibrations and uh she was she was the website developer but also like a sex educator there and um and yeah I miss being in that world of what a great job oh it was pretty great we, we both <laughs> Yes, they had a free box of like things from the vendors and people would just like paw through it and take home what they want. And I do, I do miss those days. We cried well, when she I, lost that job. <laughs> well, if I'm allowed to send toys to New Zealand, I'm sure we can make it happen. But it would, I, I, even a book a costs like a 60 or $70 just to send a paperback. It's, it's not worth it. Yeah. You're probably better off buying from Australia. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I've already found the six um, toy shops here that are progressive and inclusive so that's, that's good thank you for okay and will you please tell us where you can be located and also where body bookworms is sure of course you can find me at tinkimlam.com so it's my name no hyphen or spaces and i am on the social media the i sound like such an old person i'm on social media <laughs> as <laughs> ms tin kim so my my ms magazine um reading is showing uh and uh body bookworm is b-a-w-y b-a-w-d-y bookworms.com and same thing on, on all of our social media so you can find me in those places so cool and i wish you the best of luck with the second book release and writing the third book i'm so excited to continue to watch you fly